It was, the, it was the whole atmosphere at the time. It hadn't been quite 50 years yet. It will be in 2013. But you couldn't drink out of a water fountain. It, it, it's sad that when you go to a store and, and you could buy uh, anything you want to buy, but you couldn't try it on. They had a counter where, they, where the white could sit up there and, you know, and eat. And we had to go down in the basement. My grandmother was one of my favorite people in the world, I have to say that. Uh, it was the one place that my parents allowed me to go and spend the night. So when he brought her to Birmingham, she was lying in the back seat of his car. He had placed a blanket over her and put a pillow back there. And we just knew she was very ill because she wasn't talking. She wasn't moving. It was through the efforts of my mom that we were able to get her taken to, today it's known as Princeton Hospital, but then it was known as uh, West End Baptist Hospital. But she was placed in the basement, as were all black people that were brought there. And um, it wasn't because they didn't have the money to pay. It was because black people were not allowed to be in the hospital rooms. So I had so many wonderful memories of her, but what I remember most was sitting in that chair by her bed in the basement of the hospital. And I wondered as I got older, why, why, why were we relegated to the basement? I can remember one, one night my brother and I were coming from the 8th Avenue Theater, uh, and uh, it was about 11 o'clock and the police stopped us. And uh, we, were, we were young. Uh, maybe 12 and 13, and uh, they stopped us and searched us and kicked us. And I always wondered, why, why did they kick us? Because we, we were no trouble. We didn't resist. We did everything they told us to do. But they kicked us and told us to get home. And that always stuck in my mind because I always wondered, later I began to think, how would they feel if someone had, had done their child that way? Because we were just children. We were already afraid of them when they stopped us. There was always polices around in that area, so that was nothing unusual for us to see uh, the policemen. That was just the atmosphere. They would call you to the car and uh, roll the window up uh, on, your, on your head, you know, put your head in here. And then when you put your head in there, they roll the window up, ask you questions about maybe something that had happened in the community if you knew such and such a person. It was just a... a it, the whole atmosphere at that time was, was oppressive. We were born into that type of living. You were born uh, saying that 
uh, it was a white world, white had privileges. So you believe that. And I realized when you could go into stores like Pizzitz and Loveman's and buy clothes, but you couldn't try them on if you were black. I had an issue with that. So I knew something had to be done about it, but didn't know what. And then when I heard about the movement, I figured this is something that I can do to make things different. The children brought about the 1964 Civil Rights Act that Linda Johnson signed. The children brought about the, the 65 Voting Act of Selma. Without uh, Birmingham and the children, there could not have been a Selma and the Voting Act of 65. Know your history. Just read about it. Talk to people before we die. I think our baby boomers were just outstanding because they were ordinary people who did extraordinary things. nineteen sixty three it was a year that started much like any other year in Alabama temperatures were cold and on New Year's Day Oklahoma goes down fighting as Alabama winds up on top 17 to nothing but for some Alabamians the year seemed to promise more of the same bombing had become a way of life in Birmingham routinely Black homes were bombed. As kids, we could be sitting on our porch any evening, on our por front porch any evening, and we would hear that sound in the background. It always felt like the earth shook. Boom. Somewhere in the background, you'd hear this boom, but then you'd always hear, some, uh, you'd feel something that felt like the earth moved or shook. And then we knew, uh, as young people, we had really come to know that sound, we knew what it was when we heard it. So we knew within a few minutes, the phone would ring. And when the phone rang, we knew that there would be someone on the other end saying, they just bombed the A.G. Gaston Motel, or they just bombed the home of A.D. King, or Fred Shuttlesworth. The new governor, George Wallace, after soundly defeating moderate attorney Ryan DeGraffenreed in a runoff, would set the tone for the coming year. George actually ran the first time against John Patterson. He lost, and the reason why he lost was it was because of uh, he he wasn't he, he wasn't a die hard in the wood racist, and the guy beat him who who was. I was working with uh, the candidate that was running against him, Ryan DeGraffenry, and we did about five or six statewide telecasts, and I was his announcer, and. Uh, I was not too sure how it would be accepted by the, the governor after I'd worked so closely with Ryan DeGraffenry when he ran, ran against him. They were in a runoff, by the way, but uh, I think Ryan sort of ran out of money for the runoff and Governor Wallace got elected. George, as a matter of fact, uh, had a meeting and was invited to and sat with A.G. Gadsden and Arthur Hughes and others here in the uh, Negro community at that time. George Wallace did. Uh, but no judge, after four years, boy, he says, never again. You'll never out nigger me again. He made it very clear uh, in his inauguration about states' rights. Uh, so he left no doubt as to where he stood relative to, to segregation. Uh, he ran on that platform. He was inaugurated in that pa uh, platform. And he governed on that platform. He was very much the segregationist when he took office. In the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth, I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. <laughs> You know, those candidates, 
up in Washington, that little old Bobby Sox and his brother, the president. They'd give anything in the world if we had some trouble here. If we don't have any trouble, we can beat them at your own game. Well, Bull, Bull Connor was uh, totally, completely ignorant. And the only thing he had to hang his head on it, it was, was discrimination. Bull Connor probably had some connections to the KKK. Uh, Bull Connor wasn't the brightest guy out there. I knew Bull when he would call games at Rickwood Field. He would be up there in the broadcast booth. Negroes could go to Rickwood Field. But that was a little place way out there in the right field called the Bleachers, way out there, way out there. in the back, you in the back gate and go in this little spot in there. And I'm going to give you an example of Bull Connor's broadcast. There he is, he is in the second inning, and there they are, and there's Walt Dropo. Walt Dropo steps to the back. And there the wind up, and there he is. There comes a page, and here it comes. Right. And there, Walt Dropo, he's digging in again, and here it comes, and ball one. And here it comes again, the pitcher winding up, here it comes, here it comes, Walt Tropo's dug in there, and Walt Tropo's got a hump in him, and there he is, there comes the pitcher, and there he goes, and there it goes. Landing in the coal bin. And what he was referring to, the coal bin, was black pole, what it looked like coal, and so it's in the coal bin. Now, that was Eugene Bull Connor. He, he played right, right into type. I mean, the way he acted, the way he, uh, what he said, what he did. You can never whip these boys if you don't keep you and them separate. I think they had a meeting out at Hope High School, or I guess White Citizens Council. You've got to keep the white and the black separate, just like you got to keep them in school. And he was, you know, ranting and raving, <laughs> and uh, he pointed out, he said, what's causing all the trouble around here is those blanket and black newsmen back there. He, he was just an ignorant bully. Racial tensions in 1961 and 62 had reached a boiling point in Alabama. An iconic photo of a burning bus became a symbol seen around the world. The beating of freedom riders, the defiant city and state politicians made the state's business community uneasy. The city commission at the time was bad for business. Mayor Art Haynes had closed 67 parks, 38 playgrounds, eight swimming pools, and four golf courses rather than to obey a court order to desegregate them. So uh, in 62, they began to look at a way to change the form of government from a three-member city commission, and they decided that it would be best to go to a mayor-council form of government. Later in the year, Birmingham citizens voted to change that commission, but Haynes and fellow commissioners would not go without a legal fight. So at one time, what you had was, you had both a city commission and a mayor council form of government. You had two forms of government in 1963. Just in case, Bull Connor would also run for mayor in the upcoming election. In February, the Alabama Supreme Court lets the upcoming election stand.
nearby Georgia. The SCLC and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. meet to discuss a plan called Project C. It was mostly a local movement at that particular time, but the strategy was that Birmingham was ground zero. So you want to bring the heavy hitters in. Dr. King was the heavy hitter, and in April was was when he first began uh, the the focal point of the movement or the focal point of the national attention on what was happening in Birmingham. Reverend Shuttlesworth was the key figure, and I don't know if history will ever give. Uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth, the credit that he did, that he's due. Reverend Shuttlesworth was on the ground. He was he was uh, taking the beatings. He was there every day. He was at the meetings. He was hospitalized. He galvanized the community. Uh, he helped enroll children at, 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 when the schools were integrated. Reverend Shuttlesworth was the key figure uh, in the Birmingham movement. March 5th, former Alabama Lieutenant Governor Albert Boutwell and Bull Connor are set for a runoff after the election fails to determine a winner. Sunday, March 24th, another bombing at a private home. Two people are injured. Damage reaches two city blocks. April 2nd, Albert Boutwell is elected along with a nine-man council. Legal challenges still exist leaving the city with two mayors, Boutwell and Haynes. They decided with that they would, they would uh, co-rule Birmingham. Bull Connor would remain in charge of the police and fire departments. April 3rd, sit-ins would begin at downtown Birmingham lunch counters. You had the boycotts, you had the selective buying campaigns, uh, protesters coming downtown. They were picking all the stores around. Because when you go in the love, you just go down, Nick Rose grind, well, Nick was grinding the basement. Why can't I ride that train at the zoo? Why can't I see a duck at the park? Why can't I use the bathroom at Newberry's? Why is everything separate? Why am I at the back of the bus? You know, we would try to integrate like Chris's and J.J. Newberry. As a student, I, I was in the 11th grade. There were some people from the um, Southern Christian Leadership Conference came and started recruiting um, students from our high school. And I was secretary of our organization. And we would meet every Monday at Hopewell Baptist Church in North Birmingham. We would go to mass meetings after school, and we did that from January up until April. Customers did not want to come to these stores downtown because, you know, you had these children uh, uh, running around downtown, roaming around downtown. You had these boycotts. You had these protests. It was bad for business. We need to do something in order uh, to restore the peace. You know, uh, 16th Street Baptist Church was the very first black church built in Birmingham. So there were always people coming through. It was an exciting place to be. And on this particular day, I um, was working in the back. I think I was doing something with the mail. And normally there are always people there. I didn't think anything about it, but this group started singing. And the songs that they were singing, I think was what got my attention. So I got up and went to the door. And this is when the church office was right behind the sanctuary. But I got up and um, went to the door and peeped out, and what I could see was that the lower auditorium, the sanctuary, was completely filled. Uh, so was the balcony. But even more exciting than that, the people that were there were people like me, young people my age, some a little younger, some a little older, but they were rocking and singing, and there was just an energy and an excitement there. And I had seen a little of um, the story of Dr. King on television. I wasn't sure what this was about, but I did know, I was sure, that I wanted to be part of it. Instantly, I made up my mind, I want to be part of this, whatever this is. Dr. Martin Luther King. I 
still think the vast majority of Negroes in the South are convinced that nonviolent resistance is the most potent weapon available to the Negro in the struggle for freedom. Prior to seeing him on that day, I used to always watch him on TV. That was my first time seeing him in person. And I was so excited because to us he was a celebrity. And I did know that he was a freedom fighter and he believed in nonviolence. And he would often uh, say on TV that, you know, we, we were going to get there, but it was just going to take a while. So I just thought that if I could be a part of the changes being made, then surely I want it to be. I have had many experiences in my relatively young life, but I have never in my life had an experience like I am now having in Birmingham, Alabama. This is the most inspiring movement that has ever taken place in the United States of America. Reverend Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, and Fred Shuttlesworth lead a march despite an injunction prohibiting them. King is arrested and jailed. It is from this jail that he writes a letter to the white clergy of Birmingham. They felt that the local authorities could, could better handle what was going on without his intervention. That was his response in which he came back and said that their stance would do nothing to help uh, uh, deal with the problems in Birmingham. Easter Sunday. Blacks attempt to attend worship services at white churches. 32 people are arrested, marching to City Hall. The following week, demonstrators stayed sit-ins at local lunch counters. Many are arrested. As April concludes, the movement appears to be losing steam. The leaders decide on a bold move. They said that they wanted the children to participate. One of the graduates from the Hooper City High School was a participant, and she came out and recruited us. She wanted her school to be a part of I would go with my father every Monday night to a New Pilgrim Baptist Church. He was a musician for the Alabama Christian Movement Choir, one of the musicians there. And uh, I would listen as the speakers uh, gave the agenda for the, for the night, and everybody was just so into it, and I became into it as well. They had a meeting at 16th Street Baptist Church. The, the place was just packed with children excited to, to, to see Dr. King. The children uh, were you because they had a lot of older people, and was, some older people were afraid. And then some, some business and, and some and working folks was afraid because they'd lose their job. The lady that my father worked for, uh, a lot of members of my family had worked for her. And uh, one time my older brother had gotten into some trouble and uh, she helped my dad get him out of it. This was before the, the marching started. But he came home and told us that she told him that if any of us got in trouble for marching, she wouldn't be able to help him. Reverend Shuttlesworth tells the story that the night before the first march, that he and Dr. King argued in the hotel room, you're sending children to do the job that adults should be doing. And Dr. King listened, and I think he was deeply worried. James Bevel made the children march. Dr. King was not in favor of the children marching. He did not want them hurt. During that previous evening and during the night, Reverend James Bevel had started the wheels turning and had already alerted the children. He was closer to our age, when I'm maybe 20 something years old, so we could readily identify with him. Don't worry about your children. They are gonna be all right. Don't hold them back if they want to go to jail for they are doing a job for not only themselves, but for all of America and for all mankind. We heard about it uh, on radio. We said that's gonna be a party. If you listened to Shelley, or if you had attended that meeting, you knew exactly 
what that meant. Here's going to be the cold word. You know what I'm saying? There's going to be a party in the park this morning. That's the sign that everybody to go. We teenagers, everybody knows tall Paul, y'all. He was with W-E-N-N, and so was Thin Man. And we knew when he said D-Day, we knew nobody goes to school that day. So at 11 o'clock the next day at my school, someone showed up with a big poster board sign, and it said, it's time. Students left the school. They, All the schools around Birmingham. They climbed uh, fences, some of them. Some of them just walked out of the doors. Uh, some came out through the window. The gates were locked, so we had to either climb the fence or we tried to make a, a big hole, you know, tear the fence down to get out. So when it was time to go, all of us just had to go. And we marched from uh, my high school, from 6th Avenue, all the way over to 16th Street Baptist Church. We didn't go to school that day. We went straight to the march. We started out over on 33rd, over in Collegeville, and walked on to down to 16th Street. We got there, it was so many children from everywhere. I mean, all schools. Uh, we were told to leave the church and walk with someone that you didn't know because there were students from all schools, and we were headed to City Hall. Not to say anything to anyone else. There would be people there jeering the crowd, maybe, but not to say anything, but just go on until we got to City Hall. There we knew once we got there, we would kneel and pray and sing freedom songs. And we walked straight on down and walked in twos, and I walked in pairs, and, and that's where they had the paddy, paddy wagons, and they arrested us there. And if we walk across the park, you can see the dogs barking at us. So when we got to Fifth Avenue and 17th Street, that's when the hose pipes and the dogs and everything hit us. We, they taught us how to fold ourselves up to keep from getting hit in the face. What happened was that the local authorities really played into the hands of the demonstrators and the protesters. We were in the park. And when the marchers came out of the church and started across the park, that's when the fire hoses came out. And of course, everybody started running then. And they just start spraying the fire, the water, on all, just all around. The water hose experience uh, is a very painful experience. When you hit with that water, it feels like a bunch of bumblebees on you. And it was stinging. He was trying to keep it out job. And it was a very hurting situation. It, it, it was hard. I mean, the, it, 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 it would literally knock you down. Oh, oh, no more weeping. No more weeping. No more weeping over me. And before. And go home to my Lord and be free. Well, we have four proposals or uh, demands. One, the desegregation of all of the facilities in the stores, uh, downtown stores, and uh, if they have branches, these would be inc included also. That would include desegregating the lunch counters, the fitting rooms, the restrooms, and what have you. Second, uh, upgrading uh, better employment opportunities for Negroes in all of these uh, stores. Third, that we are urging the merchants to recommend to the city commission, uh, the city council, the dropping of all of the charges against the persons who've been arrested in these demonstrations because we feel that all of them have been unjustly arrested. They are only seeking their constitutional rights on the basis of the First Amendment of the Constitution. The fourth thing is a request uh, that the merchants will urge the city commission or the city council to appoint a biracial committee uh, to deal with a set a timetable for the integration of the public schools, the opening of the parks on an integrated basis, the integration of the library, and uh, all of the other areas where we have segregation in Birmingham.
in a way it was fun, but it was kind of uh, frightening too. Everybody was together and we talking, we singing, and we going to do what we wanted to do. One of the uh, things that the protesters wanted to do was get arrested, fill up the jails. That was part of the whole strategy. That was the straw that broke the camel's back nationally to see those things happening in Birmingham, in the United States. I was 16 years old. 15. I was 18. I was 16. Well, actually, I was 15. I had a birthday that really come, and I had really turned 16. 14. I was 14. There were so many students there, and they were trying to figure out what to do with us. And uh, after we got into city jail, uh, uh, there was uh, Dick Gregory, the comedian. You can see the bruises on him. And uh, he gave us a show, and uh, it was just unreal. I didn't think when I went that I was going to be jailed. I went to jail. Then the best, when they locked you up, that was a scary part, but after you stay in so many days, you don't worry about it. The police were very cruel. They would come in on you while you were um, uh, taking a shower at night. So we took our shower in the daytime. No phone call, no nothing. So on the fifth day, a guy had got out, and he called my parents. My father and uncle came and got me out of the, out of the Bethlehem County jail. We had been calling the hospital, the morgue, and everywhere where other kids were, but they couldn't find me. I was second to city jail. It was full. They took me to juvenile court. It was full. They took me to the fairgrounds. It was not full. So for the next few days, that's where I was. We were taken to county jail, and we were locked up there. We stayed there overnight, and then from there to uh, Fair Park. That's where we was. I was there for eight days. I stayed in about three days. And we stayed at the fairground from that Saturday until that Thursday when I was released. I was in jail for six days. My sister came uh, up. My father stayed in the car, and uh, she came to identify me. And uh, they asked, is this your sister? And she said, yes. And uh, I went home. May 8th, with the whole world watching, Birmingham businesses and the new political leadership promised to talk. In the city of Birmingham, the Department of Justice some time ago instituted an investigation into voting discrimination. It supported in the Supreme Court an attack on the city's segregation ordinances. We have, in addition, been watching the present controversy to detect any violation of the federal civil rights or other statutes. In the absence of such violation or any other federal jurisdiction, our efforts have been focused on getting both sides together to settle in a peaceful fashion. The very real abuses too long inflicted on the Negro citizens of that community. Today, as the result of responsible effort on the part of both white and Negro leaders, over the last 72 hours, the business community of Birmingham has responded in a constructive and commendable fashion and pledged that substantial steps would begin to meet the justifiable needs of the Negro community. Negro leaders have announced suspension of their demonstration. We would hope that this channel of communication between the white and Negro communities will prevent the necessity of further protest action or demonstrations such as have been. May 11th, the A.G. Gaston Motel and the home of Reverend A.D. King are bombed. President Kennedy sends U.S. troops to military bases near Birmingham. I call upon all the citizens of Birmingham, both Negro and white, to live up to the standards their responsible leaders set last week in reaching the agreement. To realize that violence only breeds more violence. And that goodwill and good faith are most important now to restore the atmosphere in which last week's agreement can be carried out. There must be no repetition of last night's incidents by any group. This government will do whatever must be done to preserve order, to protect the lives of its citizens, and to uphold the law of the land. The situation's quiet at the present time. We are hopeful that this matter, as the president said last night, will be worked out by people in Birmingham, people of goodwill uh, 
attempting to get this uh, very serious and difficult situation resolved. May 20th, after being suspended by the Board of Education, 1,081 black students are sent back to class by a federal judge. On May 23rd, the Alabama Supreme Court rules that the new mayor and council can assume power. June 11th, after George Wallace refuses to desegregate the University of Alabama, President John F. Kennedy federalizes the Alabama National Guard. Newsman Joe Langston covered the event. So the owners of the radio stations got together and decided that they only have one reporter reporting the activities on the campus. They didn't want a repeat of what happened at Ole Miss. And there were a lot of rioting going on over there. And they didn't want the same thing in Tuscaloosa. So they chose me to cover the thing. Nobody was allowed on campus. Uh, there was only those two students were the only ones going to register that day. State troopers everywhere. We were in, there were a few of us inside the Foster Auditorium. That's where they registered back then. And uh, we, were, we were told. I had for a gentleman came and said, now, well, the Governor Wallace is going to be asked to step aside at the door by the Captain Back, the Assistant Attorney General. He will refuse to do so. Captain Back will return to the National Guard Armory where they were headquartered. He will federalize the National Guard. General Graham will come back, ask the Governor to step aside. He will do so. The students will be admitted. We were told all this before anything happened. I stand here today as governor of this sovereign state and refuse to willingly submit to illegal usurpation of power by the central government. This afternoon, following a series of threats and defiant statements, the presence of Alabama National Guardsmen was required on the University of Alabama to carry out the final and unequivocal order of the United States District Court of the Northern District of Alabama. That order called for the admission of two clearly qualified young Alabama residents who happened to have been born Negro. Well, I would just like to say that I'm glad that the registration is over and everything is over now. I think we can get down to studying. This is our main purpose here, and I'm glad that it has all been over now, and all we have to do now is get down, go get our books and start studying. That's so. all. Well, I'd like to say that at this time, this is our first and final press conference. And uh, we'd like to say that uh, we are very uh, happy to note that our registration has taken place without incident. And uh, we hope that we will um, be able to get on to our main purpose for being here, and that is to get an education. It went off very smoothly, no problems, no nothing. July 12th, the 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals orders Birmingham schools to desegregate by fall. July 23rd, the Birmingham City Council repeals all segregation ordinances. The past has taught us a great deal, but the real concern of this city is the future. I hope this committee will never look backward at the past except to learn its lessons and avoid its mistakes. Let us put the past firmly behind us. Let us fix our eyes and our attention on the present and what lies ahead. July 31st, the Justice Department files suit against Jefferson County to reinstate 2,000 rejected black voter applicants. August 20th, Another bomb explodes at the home of Arthur Shores. When the bomb went off, uh, it shook our house. So we went out and ran up the street there. We pretty much knew the direction of the sound. So we ran up there and we saw that his house had been bombed. And I remember the police came out and uh, made all everybody uh, disperse. And wouldn't even let you cut your front put your light on. And we walked around through the community and uh, they said that if you didn't cut your front, front porch light off, they would shoot it out. 
August 27th, the March on Washington draws hundreds of marches from Birmingham. We're going to march. We're going to walk together. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing together. We're going to stay together. We're going to moan together. We're going to groan together. And after a while, we'll say, freedom, freedom, freedom now. September 4th, in the shadow of another bomb at attorney Arthur Shore's home, white demonstrators attempt to stop the integration of Graymont Elementary School, West End, and Ramsey High School. Sunday, September 15th. As fall approached, the success of the previous months of struggle seemed to promise that change would indeed be coming. But any hope of the end to the violence would be crushed on a warm, rainy Sunday morning. I remember how Jane and Adam and myself, how we walked to church, having so much fun. Earlier that morning, bombers would quietly place a box of dynamite attached to a timer under the steps of the church. Churches were being bombed uh, throughout Birmingham. And the 16th Street Baptist Church was a uh, well-known meeting place for blacks at that particular time. She was so fond loving. She she loved to help play baseball, and that little time we had together, I just really loved her, and she loved to be around me because we were so close in age, and she loved to draw. She was so sweet. She wasn't afraid of anything. Cynthia was uh, what we might call today a soulmate. Cynthia was adopted, and uh, what I remembered most about her, she was very petite. But she had a great sense of humor. Denise, she was so quiet and sweet, and she would get along with everybody. Everybody just loved her. And Carol, we was in all in the choir together, and we would stop by Carol Robertson's house to walk to choir rehearsal with us. They were just nice young ladies. Something that's rarely mentioned is that there were actually five girls in the bathroom. The fifth girl was Sarah Collins. She was 12 years old. And Sarah survived the blast that took place in the women's bathroom here. I arrived at church on September 15th about 9.30. I went upstairs to the church office. All of the adult classes were upstairs, so I took them their materials. Then I went back downstairs, but I see them there in the bathroom. And when you entered the women's bathroom, there was one large room with freestanding mirrors and sofas and so forth. And beyond that large room was another door that led into the actual bathroom where the toilets and the face bowls where you wash your hands were. And they're talking and primping and uh, I, I know that there are four of them there. What I don't know is that there's a fifth person there, Sarah, who's in the back part of the bathroom. But I spoke to them, and uh, they were laughing and talking. And then I hurried, I said, well, and let me get these reports done, and hurrying up the steps. And as I cleared the top of the steps, the phone was ringing in the church office. And I go in, and there's no one there. I answer the phone, and the mail caller says three minutes. And as quickly as he said that, he hung up. Holding my material still in my arms, I just hung the phone up, walked out of this door and began walking into the sanctuary. And I actually took about 15 steps. We counted them one day. And I was right at this point here, about to walk down this aisle uh, when the bomb exploded. I was standing over from by the sink and they came in and as uh, they were leaving out, they, they stopped Denise asked Addie to tie the sash on her dress. And uh, I was looking over from the sink. But when she reached her hand out to tie the sash, 
and all of a sudden I heard a loud sound boom and I called out Ed a name about three times first I had to call Jesus cause it scared me it scared me so bad and I said Eddie 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 and I couldn't see nothing because the debris the glass and stuff got in my eyes and it blinded me instantly and all of a sudden I heard someone outside holler, somebody bombed the 16th Street Church. And when they came in, they came straight in and and got me out. And I found out later on in the year that his name was Samuel Rutledge. He came in and put me in his arm and he carried me out through the hole that was that the bomb made. This was a door and the steps came down like that. The person hid under the bomb, under the steps to plant the bomb and then the bomb exploded inward to this window here which is where the bathroom was. The area where the girls were, you would, it's not an area that you can stand in, physically stand in now, but if you could, this is it. This is like the inside looking out. This is for people who were actually standing in the bathroom where the girls, where the explosion came inward. This is the clock that was upstairs. This is how we know what time the bomb exploded, 1022, because the clock stopped. The ambulance came and rushed me to the hospital. I was laying on this little cot for a while, waiting for the eye doctor because he wasn't in. And I remember Janie came in. And uh, when she came in, I asked her, uh, what was Addie? And she said that Addie had hurt her back, but she had, she was coming to see me tomorrow. And, uh, but later on, she was talking to somebody. And she told them that uh, one of her sisters was killed in the bombing. And I was, I was upset because I didn't understand why they had to kill Addie. And then later on, uh, uh, after I come out, they rushed me to surgery and they operate on my eye. And uh, I found out that the other three girls, Denise, Carol, and Cynthia, they was killed also. And uh, I was going through this thing I, in my mind all the time, crying at night, wondering why would these girls was killed. I just didn't understand. It was something that we never talked about. No one ever even said, well, are you afraid? Are you okay? One thing about it, they, when I went back to school, they didn't counsel me. They didn't give me any counsel. And I went back to school in a terrible condition. That was a proverbial shock heard around the world because that just showed how dastardly and how cowardly and how mean-spirited, how racist Birmingham was, that four little girls in a church of all places were bombed, including one girl who was decapitated. If that doesn't show uh, evil, I don't know what does. The four charged with the bombing were not even arrested until uh, 15 or 20 years later. They still lived a long life, and yet, when it was time for them to, to be tried and go to jail, the only thing they did was just die. They didn't spend no time in jail. They just died. And still, some is out there. I really believe some are still out there. Oh, they'll be shouting. They'll be shouting. They'll Black people thought that our chances, uh, uh, we've been backed up another hundred years because of Kennedy. 
and they were not aware of the fact that Lyndon Johnson was the one that that, that moved it that moved it forward. I remember feeling very determined, very confident that this is the way it should be. We should all be able to go to the movie. We should all be able to swim. We should all be able to walk in a store and order food if we want to. And that was just my strongest word back then. I felt very determined. Martin Luther King said something, there was no slavery. He said, no one is free until we are all free. I would like to tell our young people to take charge. Uh, Don't take life for granted. These things happen, and it happened within your lifetime. It took us in 63 to do what we had to do. I want to say that I'm glad that I was a part of the of the children's movement at that time. And uh, I have seen change, but still, there's still changes that need to be, there are changes that need to be made. So is it worth it? They're one of the best things I ever did in my life. I believed in what we were doing. When we marched out of that church, I knew what we were trying to change. I understood that very well. And I really understood it when the church was bombed and my girlfriends were killed. When I go into uh, uh, different office buildings or banks and different public service buildings and see how we treat each other, somebody has to tell the story of what happened that you have this job, that you would become more aware of how you treat the people you serve. So I want to inspire anybody, the young, the old, the unknowledgeable, to seek this because education and knowledge are power. Now, a lot of people understand that we that we live, we, we're all Americans. We live in the greatest country in the world, and we must act like, we must act like. And we paid the price for them, and, and they turned around giving it all back, kidding each other. And uh, they got all the opportunities now to do anything they want to. They need to take advantage of it. Because you know what? When we get to heaven, there is no black and white. There is no black and white. 1963. It was a year that brought much change, a year of sacrifice and pain, but change and hope. And there would be more of all of that to come in the decades that followed, that good people of all faiths, all colors, could join together to someday share in what we all seek, the free pursuit of our own happiness. I'm always cheering for us wherever I go. I speak a lot about Birmingham and I always give us, I I tell our history, but I give us a a positive um, out forecast, if you will, or outlook on where we're headed. I think uh, the majority of the people that I know, particularly those that are in uh, uh, the positions of power uh, are trying to take us to a good place. I think that when you say my melting pot, you take everything and, and melt it, and you don't know what it is. You don't expect it, you can't taste it. You can't understand if it's a melting in that pot. I would like to, and I still believe today, that America is a huge salad bowl. And I think that if you put your carrots in that salad, your tomatoes, it remains tomatoes, the cucumbers in there, the lettuce in there, it's still, it's there in that salad bowl. You understand? It remains what it is. It's not, you don't just say it. It's not there anymore. It's, it's, it, 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 it's carrots, it's tomato. I know what it is. And I treat it as such. So I think America should be that. We should be a big salad bowl. Well, we remain, we are, but we in this big bowl together and make a great salad, you understand? Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me and before I be a slave. I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free.
No more moaning. No more moaning over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. No more weeping, no more weeping over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, they'll be singing, they'll be singing over me, and before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave, and go home to my They'll be shouting, they'll be shouting, they'll be shouting over me, and before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave, and go They'll be praying, they'll be praying over me, and before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave, and go home to my Lord and be free. And before I'd be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord. And